to mention that um, for the first five sessions, we have looked at a number of how to do research. We have also talked about um, qualitative data research in the beginning. And I talked about the types of qualitative research. Then I went on to the centrality of a PhD. Then I went on from the centrality of the PhD to um, how to select a research topic. And then went on to explain um, part of literature review, how to be able to um, do different types of writing uh, in terms of literature review and the, the skill set in doing so. The idea that argument, evidence, and illustration, and I showed you a number of times. We also spent some time trying to look at um, research problems in the centrality of the PhD, for which we are given an assignment. Then I went to theories in information, uh, theories uh, in, um, in, in research and their role, which I talked about research framework, conceptual framework, and the role of a theory. And I spent some time explaining, having a question, a Q&A with you on that. So from there, we, the next thing to do is to start picking up um, uh, one or two of the, or two or more of the qualitative research techniques and explaining to you how we conduct it. So today we'll be talking about case study, then another time we'll try to look at uh, uh, digital ethnography. And if there is time, we'll try to do phenology. If there's not much time, I'll move on to analysis. And then maybe when we finish the analysis, I'll come back and explain phenology in a brief way. Or maybe I'll combine the digital, no, this digital ethnography is quite different, so. Okay, so what I'll try to do today is to bring an understanding that the, this one, the third one, case study. I remember when we talked about the different qualitative, qualitative research, I remember I told you that qualitative research seeks to conduct research in the perspective, in the perspective of the, of the participants who, who the research is about or the research concerns. And it's an, we try to take a naturalistic um, um, inquiry approach to be able to study the real the situations in the real world context. It's not manipulative, non-controlling. The forms of data are observation, interviews, audiovisual, and documents. And it tries to look at the findings in the in the context in which it's cre created. So the temporal context, historical context, the social context. Mm -hmm. But what we did that we discussed difference between quantity and quality, which I don't think I need to do that as of now as a PhD program, you should know the differences. But what was important is that I talked about the different types of qualitative research, and I think I even mentioned um, grounded theory. But mm -hmm. for the purpose of our program, we we'll look at ethnography mm -hmm. and case study. Allow blocking. Hey, John, you are you and your wife are interfering in our teaching. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyway, so from there, um, we now delve into the case study. So I remember I've explained a humanistic phenomenology and then transcendental phenomenology, ethnography. And I remember that they I told you that I would take one of the ethnography dimensions and try to explain that digital ethnography. But, but today, what I'll try to delve into is um, case study. Because case study is one of the um, approaches that in the business school, we all use in carrying out research. Now we call case study, all these different types of qualitative research methods as a research strategy. So you have got the approach being qualitative research. Then the, the strategies that we apply that we can use technology, ethnography, and then we can also draw on this one that we have here, a um, case study and the other ones I mentioned the other time. So case study is of, comes from two words, a case and study. Now a case is a bounded system, which could be a, a group, an activity or a process. When we conduct a study on that bounded system, then we see we have done a case study. Now that bounded system represents a real world instance or occurrence in which we want to study. Now, when you do a, a study of a case, what you are trying to do is to delve into that particular bounded system and do an intensive analysis of it. So you just don't study just the system itself, but the context in which the historical, the social, and the temporal context in which the case dwells within. So we, in a study of a case, we take a case, which is a bounded system, and then we conduct an intensive analysis of it. In that scenario, that case we have selected 
or boundless system you have selected becomes the unit analysis of that study. So for example, if you are a finance student, you want to carry out financial literacy among market women. My market women are represent self-employed, largely self-employed uh, uh, persons who may be engaged in a trading activity. Now, some of the persons as an individual may be an, may be an micro enterprise. So it may be a registered or non-registered or unregistered firm who is conducting, who is actually participating in the market system. Now, when I say I'm doing a case study, each of those market women as an enterprise could be a case for me to study. That's one. That other, another approach is that I could study different market communities. So when I take Kaneshi market, it could be one case. When I take Abubushi market, it could be one case. case. KJTR market, Tema market, um, Kwadasu market, Salaga market, Agbozo market, uh, um, Tei market. All of these could be one case that I could study. So depending on what you are doing, your need analysis can be at the micro level, where is at the, that micro enterprise, or can be a little bit of a method of where you're looking at the markets, a, a market system. So you're looking at the whole a, 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 a system of different people, um, uh, a system which becomes like a community of different, different micro or self-employed market traders who have come together to trade there. So a tomato ma a, a market could be different tomato traders who have come together to be able to provide tomato for sale for customers US to buy. So on the road to Takra day, I think somewhere on the Kinko Road, there's a market there, which is a tomato market. A lot of people from Niger are usually seen there. Okay. So I'm just trying to let you understand how a case can be understood. So this class itself can be a case. The whole class can be a case. Class of 2022 can be a case that I could study. Now, a case study matters when there's a need for you to do that intensive spotlight microscopic evaluation of a phenomenon or a set of processes within a phenomenon, within a particular phenomenon or within community. Now, those processes or phenomena that we want to study, you want to study in, the, in this natural setting so that you can be able to have some understanding of why it occurs, how or how it occurs, or even when it occurs and what's occurring. So usually anybody who is carrying out a case and uh, engages into that intensive analysis to test the prevailing explanations or theoretical propositions or ideas and to refine knowledge. Now, an example could be that I could do a study in a committee where I'm looking at poverty and livelihoods. Or I could look at rice sharing services like Uber. Or I do a case study where I focus on leadership and organization in a particular period. Okay. Now let's take this example. Now this is a, a case study which depicts how micro traders use mobiles to engage in their market activities. Number one, what you see here is a story about Ante Kusia, who is a tomato retail trader. Remember I mentioned that you can be in the market system and you can be a trader in there. Now, Ante Kusia, the first paragraph, referred to as AE, is a tomato retail trader. She has junior high school level education and has been working as a tomato retailer since June 2008. AA works with Jane, who serves as an intermediary between her and the markets in the villages. Then John buys tomato sale prices from the farmers and AA retails them on the market. Usually this one we call a mechanical argument, telling you how to work in AA's uh, shopping, uh, sh shopping enterprise or retail enterprise. Now that first paragraph gives you an indication of the context of AA, what she's doing. 
So it gives you a description of who AA is, which helps you to appreciate that AA has some medication. AA belongs to a network of, uh, of trading partners, including farmers and then um, another person who is a, 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 a kind of a nutrient trader who goes between, who liaises between the farmers and A, that's being gene. Has been engaged in this business since June 2008. So at the time that you are reading this work, maybe 10 years after, if AA is still having the business, that means that AA should be a very formidable business and has been sustainable to all this time. Now, that paragraph you see there is what established the context of it. Remember, we mentioned that an, a case is studied within the social, the historical, and the temporal context. So they say prior to owning the mobile phone, now, now you can see that we have explained the context. In which the first one explained well, to a large portion more about the temporal context you know, or the, 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 the way the organization works. Okay. In fact, maybe I should call it the social context, the way the social business, social business context that she works in. The second paragraph is going to explain the historical context, which is more about the phenomenon of study. So this particular historical context reflects on how AA came to own a mobile phone. So prior to owning a mobile phone, communication between AA and Jane was constrained by distance. The limited access to Jane often continued to Poor inventory management, where A could be out of stock of, to, for, to, of tomatoes for a week. In such scenarios, A had to buy from other wholesalers. That increased the coordination cost. So it's establishing what was happening before she, the necessity of buying a phone came into it. She was then advised by a friend to get a mobile phone for Jane and herself in order to enhance communication and reduce the cost and risk of frequent long journeys. In December 2008, AA purchased a, a used Samsung D500 for herself and Nokia 3315 for Jane. The cost of Jane's mobile phone was deducted from her earnings with AA. They both use, they are both using Tigo as their service provider. She opined that, now I'm going to talk about how she uses the use context. Most of my customers are in the working class, meaning they do not have much time to come to the market. I therefore call or text customers periodically and ask them if they are in need of any tomatoes and I deliver them at their offices before they close. The mobile phone enables AA to keep a record of contact details of a farm of a country. Other tools like calendar and alarm on a mobile phone are also used by AA. Now, all that you see here is that we are trying to explain who A is. The first background gives us that particular background that may help us to appreciate the rest of the story so when we talk about a being able to see a being able to use calendar and alarm we can appreciate that it is a possibility because of the her junior high school level education good. so what we do in the case study is that every good case study always has a case background before the case stories will start so that the case stories can reflect on the background to be able to build um necessity for of use. Uh, the case story is also able to um, establish that background that when you can want to understand the actors in the case, you can be able to reflect on the background story to be able to appreciate why they make certain decisions. Uh, there are different types of cases. If there's any question, anybody, you can stop me and then ask. Hello, Prof. Prof. If you can kindly make me co-host so that I can control the, the noise on the background. Okay. Now we can have exploratory case study, which can explore an intervention where no less knowledge is known, like how exploratory studies are done. Or a descriptive case study that will depend on a theory to be able to describe a real life context in which an intervention occurs, or describe the intervention itself. Or as explanatory case study that will try to just not just reveal, 
by explaining causal links in real life situations. So what you see in explanatory case study is that it will, it's appropriate for doing causal investigation where some causes of certain factors or causes of certain occurrences could be examined thoroughly. And that will give us explanatory study. A discrete study can draw, may always draw from a theory to guide the data collection. The theory will be clearly stated at the beginning and that will guide how we, or inform how we analyze the data and what data we could even collect. But exploratory study may not like may likely not draw on any theory. It may just step into the field and collect data on an area little is known, then try to make sense out of it. Now, beyond that one, we can also have whether the multiplicity of cases, in terms of got several units who have experienced something, or we can also have a single case study. So a single case study is ideal for studying extreme cases to confirm or challenge a theory or for cases where the researcher does not have access previously. So let's take an example. Something happens and there's a failure or there's a success in a particular event. Somebody can do it as a single case study. So you can, in this example here is causing financial loss to the state. Uh, lessons from the Senate case. So it's going to be about Senate, our social enterprise institution and try to understand why um, the, their actions or inactions led to the loss of value for the citizen and for the state. Now, a multiple case study is appropriate when a researcher has a skill to use more than one case to draw out a conclusion or draw up a conclusion. So he doesn't want to bring an intervention because he thinks um, in, such a, in such a scenario, the intervention needs more data to be able to, analyze, to be able to let everyone understand it. So what then you do is that you have different cases in which you can actually ask yourself that this occurrence here, is it because of A or is it because A just happened there? So if you go to another case and B is happening, even though there's no A or something else is happening, even though there is no A, then you start realizing that A is no, not the fundamental factor. There could be other explanations of why something is occurring. So the multiple case study is appropriate when you are, you will need to be able to draw on different cases to be able to tell a story and then be able to have facts internally checked with each other so that you can confirm the evidence and enhance the reliability of your work. So an example, you are trying to understand why students eat particular dishes. And then you have read the literature and they tell you that it's either about um, prior experience or the person's uh, um, mother taste, that's uh, by nature. While she was growing up, that's what was given to him. And others, others also eat a particular type of dish because of experimentation. Now, if you are not, if you want to do a study like that and you go and get different types of students, you may end up realizing that some of the students may be, be, be making that choice of um, 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 why they eat a particular food or a, a foreign a type of food because of the fact that they will grow up in that partic a particular area in which that food was served. So I, I for example, I was in um, Uganda and I met a food, the food, that, the food that we call Tuzafi in Ghana. Yeah, I met it in Uganda and I was surprised that I, that there. And they, they told me, they, they even eat it in leaves there. They told me that it's, an, it's, a, it's a delicacy, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, a delicacy for a particular tribe in um, or a particular Type, um, um, type of people or ethnic group within um, Uganda, and they like it a lot. So they even serve in some of the local um, hotels and then the eateries. So when I saw it there, I realized that it's a meal I know about it, but I'm not very used to eating, even eating it in Ghana. So even though I'm a Ghanaian, I was, I was quite surprised to find myself to uh, that I was being invited and I could see that other Africans were eating and they were telling that and we know that Ghanaians like it. Why don't you like it? The fact that Ghanaians like it does not mean that I like it. I grew up in a different part of Ghana that the different type of dish was being served and that dish is not there. So you realize that even though I come from Ghana, the next trend may be different. So if I if you say that your variable says that the origin of country will determine what the person will eat, 
It could be true, but it might not hold true all the time. You could have somebody who comes from the origin of the country's rights, but he has not been nurtured to like some of the staple foods in from the country. He might have a different type of taste because of where he grew up. So if I don't do multiple cases, I will not be able to check whether sometimes my finding is just out of chance or I can find other explanations that will rival my first finding so that I can be able to come out with a more theoretically sound conclusion. So it's very, very important that as a researcher, you always know why you are carrying out a single case or multiple case. Now, a single case is also ideal, especially when you have a very detailed issue and you are, you are with one organization and you are got layers of the issue and you want to study it in that organization alone and your, your theory can allow you to do that. Then that means that you may even do the study in one organization, but you can look at different phases. I've done like that before. I remember I was studying an organization and the organization had gone through three different phases of partnership. So I took partnership A, partnership B, partnership C. Now it's a single case, all right, but is this more of what we call a mod, um, um, an embedded case? A whole, embedded case means that it's a one case, but has embedded units of analysis. So I can compare partnership A with partnership B and compa compare partnership B with partnership C. Because I'm still having one firm, but within the firm, I'm looking at the different partnership groups. So sometimes, sometimes others may even argue that it is a holistic study that you are doing on one institution. Or it's an even, but it's, it's kind of uh, embedded too with other layers of unit of analysis. So you can look at organization as a whole and can also look at the different units within there and study them and also come out to find this. Okay. Now, doing a multiple case is also a matter of resources. So everybody has resources and time to be able to conduct a very thorough multiple case study. So that has to be captured in the beginning. So it's not all the time that you can be able to do a multiple case. You have to always look at your resource, your time, and then the, even the nature of the issue you are trying to study. Some issues you are trying to study are not very mature in, um, in terms of the phenomenal growth in the country that you are in. So the thing is at this nascent stages, and you want to do a very detailed study in it, you may not get the relevant information to be able to tell the story. I see a, a question. Obed, can you read a question for me? Uh, hello, Prof. Uh, the person possesses, uh, I think, about the food you mentioned. He's just saying uh, that it is called uh, Sadza or so. Okay. Okay. Uh, Robert, thank you. Do right, you have a, you have some connections in, in, in Uganda? Uganda is a very dangerous town. <laughs> so you have some connections there. Robert, do you want to disclose? <laughs> <laughs> no I know, if you have been there, you understand what I mean by connections. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's continue. <laughs> okay. So you can have multiple, you can have single. Now, why am I trying to explain all of this? Okay, so the first thing that you need to understand is that sometimes you can have a study that it can be embedded units, but it's also multiple. For example, you are doing a study on, let's say, um, institutional policies and how it affects students and lecturers. So you are looking at this new institutional policy that we should use tenet in. How does it affect students? How does it affect them? So the student group is one group. And the lecturer group is one group. Then you go to GIMPA, who is also having tenet in. But tenet in in GIMPA, the lecturers have their own licenses. They have got more fine. They can log on and then actually be able to manipulate their reports in many different ways, which is very different than UG that is centralized that you have to upload everything into, into research. So the lecturers and the students have to use the same approach to get the data. But in UG and uh, um, GIMPA is quite different. Now, what is interesting is that I could actually compare how lecturers use, the lecturers in UG use Tenetine as compared to lecturers in in GIMPA, then I can compare how the students use it in, 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 in UG and how students in, uh, in GIMPA use it. Now, what I've done is that I have an embedded study, like it's one organization, but it's embedded with different uni units of analysis. Then I can compare it with another. So I've got multiple embedded. Now, I can also have multiple holistic. Instead of it being embedded, I could actually look at what is the policy of e-learning in University of Ghana? And then what is the policy 
of um, of e-learning in Kenya. So what's the policy of e-learning in um, um, Takwadi Poly, um, Takwadi University? And what is the policy of e-learning in Accra University? Accra Technical University, so in Takwadi Technical University. Now, what am I doing? I'm comparing the e-learning policies of tertiary institutions. So I'm now looking at this holistically, but I'm looking at it from um, um, just the policy. So I'm doing a holistic study, but it's multiple holistic. I just wanted you to know, but usually students don't write holistic and all those things in their uh, thesis unless necessary. But I'm just trying to point out that sometimes you may come across that somebody says doing a multiple holistic study, means that he has got different units of analysis and each of them is one group that he's comparing. Somebody can also do multiple embedded, but he's staying one, one organization, multiple embedded. So two organizations, but each of them, they are different stakeholders and the stakeholders becomes one group of analysis. So you can make conclusions on what lecturers say and can also put out conclusions on what students say in that scenario. Okay. Now, how do we design a case study? Now, in designing a case study, we have different approaches, depending on the literature you are reading. Some literature tend to go for a four-step approach. What if the same organization, Monsanto is asking, what if in the same organization, but in different cultural settings, one branch in Accra, another branch in the North? Now, so somebody can say that he's still in a, an embedded study where he's looking at a, one culture, depending on the research question, each cultural setting is a unit of analysis. Do you understand me? So what is in the north is different from what is in the south. So you are now going to compare maybe marketing strategies, and you realize that the marketing strategies that you have to deploy in Accra, you can't apply, uh, deploy the same thing in the northern region. And that, there you go. You have your multiple uh, embedded case study. Oh, no, I don't even say embedded. A multiple case study. You just have a, a multiple. No, you have a one organization. You've got two different cultures in it. So it's multiple embedded, yes. And you're comparing the cultures to, you know, so it's multiple embedded. Okay, no, a single embedded, sorry, one organization. If you're comparing that of Casa Preco, that of, um, let's say, the, the, the company that does the Joy Daddy Beaters. So we look at the Casa Preco strategy and look at that of Joy Joy Daddy Beaters strategy. Now Joy Daddy Beaters is also in Accra and then in North and in Casa Preco is also in Accra and the North. So that gives you opportunity to compare the two. So thank you, Richmond, for that question. Very good question. So designing a case study. So you can have a four-step approach. You first of all develop your protocol that will guide you to collect the data and define the type of study you are doing, whether you're doing single, multiple. And, and then you also have to have the research questions in mind and the purpose of the study in mind. You conduct the case study, analyze the case study, and then And you develop conclusions and recommendations and applications based on the evidence. Then you can also have the seven step approach, which is more of a breakdown or expanded form of the four step. So instead of just designing a protocol, the protocol will guide you to be able to establish the case and what you're going to do. Within the protocol, you're going to define a research question. You're going to determine the type of study you're going to do. You're going to even make a choice of the participants who can be in it and who cannot be in it. And then so in all of these things, those of all those things will form a case study protocol report. Then after that, you go to the collect the data. Even make a uh, you you let us know which data collection method you are going to use and how over what timeline are you going to do the work your work plan. So when you finish, you collect your data based on that work plan. You analyze your data, and then you compose a case result. Now, whilst you are collecting the data, we develop what we call the we develop what we call the case study database kind of all the information collected from the field and who said what and who said this so that you can be able to have them in a very interesting interactive way of assessing them at any time okay so sometimes what will happen is that some people will take their time and write detailed notes others will also not um not, not do that they will have a just a tip a, a document that they feel when did i go there what did i do what did i find so they'll ask those they'll ask themselves those questions they'll fill it out and get their own case study report the report is relevant because you as a person your mind cannot remember everything that was taken every decision that was taken so you, you use them as goalposts to reflect on the activity that you have uh, carried out in terms of data collection i remember when i was collecting my phd data i came to ghana and by my supervisor and I was just in the field collecting data. 
after three weeks, my supervisor told me, called and um, found a way of getting to me via email and told me that am I the one doing the PhD or is he the one supervising me doing the PhD? Because you cannot be on the phone without engaging with your supervisor so that you can know whether what the data you are collecting, you can reflect on it together and know that it's relevant or not relevant. Because some people are collecting data, they show up to complete the PhD and the data is nowhere near what they want to do. So in your case study protocol, we are going to define who, what is the project about. What field procedures does data collection procedure do you intend to use? Data collection procedures, you have to think about the strategies for collecting the data. The strategy for collecting the data could be either interviews, survey, audio, uh, visual information, and documents. Okay. Now, when you look at interviews, you may then apply a questionnaire as a data collection instrument. Observation, you can even have a guide of what you're observing and you can put it down. And then documents and text, you can index the different type of documents you came across and the one that you needed to read and you could carry it out. Some of them want to allow you to carry it out. Okay, so now that you have an overview of the project, field procedures to be used, you then bring your questionnaire and then a guide for your study report. A guide for your study report, what is your study report? How you are going to write the case when you finish? Then you are going to conduct the case by selecting the different collection, data collection strategies. Then you analyze the case and develop conclusions, recommendation based on the evidence that you have. Now in the other approach, you, don't, you have to identify your research question which may be linked with your research purpose. So what are you trying to study and what is your unity of analysis? Are you doing single or multiple? Who can be your participants in the study? So you can define different types of participants. So you need to define them. The boundary refers to how the case might be constrained in terms of time, events, and processes. You collect the data and triangulate from multiple sources analyze the data and compose the report and ensure validity and reliability. But let's look at the collecting of the data part because that's what everybody may be interested in. Now, if before you can collect your data, you need to know the premise of the data collection. The premise of the data collection is related to the, all the things that led you to that point. So one, the research gas purpose, objectives, and questions that you had in mind. Are there any questions that they themselves have asked you to ask, try to answer? that you use this study to, to answer so they can move to your identity and um, extract your questionnaire well. They have got theory and conceptual framework. What theory are, are you using? And what's your conceptual framework? The framework that guides what will be done on the field. They can have a single or multiple case study or holistic or embedded. They can also have boundary of the data source, how far are you going to collect the data, especially if it's available or not available? And what skills do you have? Now, the first one is the questionnaire that will guide you to be able to collect the data irrespective of whatever you are trying to use. Interviews, we need a questionnaire. Focus group discussions, we need a questionnaire. Interviews with, um, With, with interview, uh, focus group discussion, interviews, and then even observation, sorry. Observation and even an analysis of what I observed from the internet will all need a kind of a questionnaire to guide you. So the questionnaire is something that is very, very important. And the basic outline can look like this. The record, you record the time, the dates, and then the purpose of the study and the natural certainty which you occurred. Then you introduce the research to so most often, the research questions have an introduction to the question itself, um, which is aimed at the interviewee. So you can understand that this data is being collected by uh, maybe so and so for only academic purposes. And your information will not be divulged to another person without your explicit permission. So that's why you see that in, um, in this particular scenario, we are trying to get the buy-in of the interviewee. Mm -hmm. Then we will also go on to then do the selection of the key terms that are related to what we are trying to talk about. 
Now you can then go to the demographic data of respondent and the study of the demographic study uh, data on the company or household. But this one, as of now, many people who are doing um, good studies move all the demographic questions to the end, depending on what they are doing. So that's interfere in the main questions. The main questions may then focus on the themes, the concept, the variables, which are within what you are proposed to, what you are proposed to do through your research problem and then your research purpose and your conceptual framework. Then you may also want to point out some of, um, in terms of the questions, other questions that you may not have thought about. So my questionnaire is using three variables. But when I read the literature, I realized there are two other variables that are usually not captured. So I can add that one from the literature. Or as you are discussing with the person, impromptu questions can come up and may be, be able to ask. After a very good interview, you may want to summarize your answers and be sure that the person who you um, who you interviewed has been able to understand that you have captured the thing in a way that rightfully reflects the person's understanding. So there's no ambiguity between you and the interviewees. Okay, so how does it look in practice? So we're standing here, we, we have a research question, so what is the impact of mobiles for micro trading activities of, of market traders? So that was a research that led to the paper. So how do market traders use the mobiles? What benefit do they gain? And what's the impact of, the, of using mobiles in micro trading activities or research of market traders? So from there, I can then generate my conceptual framework my um my type of case study I want to use and then the the boundary of our data sources and what is available what is as, what is not available but it could be assessed as accessible. Okay. So you have got traders that move engage the mobile phone and they use it for three possible things pre-trade activities, during trade activities and then post-trade activities. That gives you certain benefits and certain impacts. Now, look at this one. Okay, so this is about the same story, but this is about case B. Maize is a seasonal produce that requires cost saving techniques in these micro trading activities. The old dry maize is preferred to the fresh one. For this reason, planting and, and harvesting are well planned by farmers. Maize wholesalers can buy from farmers in villages and sell it to retailers in Accra. Maize is a capital. Maize is a wholesaler. Grace is a maize wholesaler who has four retailers in Accra. She has primary school level education and learned the trade from her mother. Okay, so you see it, this first paragraph giving you the context of where Grace works. Then it goes on to talk about a key argument that I wanted him to put across. Um, it talks about how she uses the mobile phone and what she uses it for. So she says she uses Nokia 2, 10 to 10 mobile phones and subscribe to MTN and Tigo. Mobile, mobile phone is made it easy for her to carry out transactions more efficiently. She does not have to travel too frequently. Okay, so this is where the work starts. She does not have to travel frequently to do her business unless she has to go around and collect data, collect her payments. This she does once in a month. Grace explains that. Grace explains that I don't need to come to a car to supply maize. All I do is take orders on the phone and hire a truck to send the community. I don't have to put my life at risk by making unnecessary journeys. Okay, so that's it. So we are in terms of collecting data, you are looking at all the different factors that can be relevant in building the story. Okay. So in, in effect, when you have made all those choices, you are supposed to hit the ground running and start collecting data. Okay. Now, there are different ways of generating a case study report. The case study report is the report an account of what happened on the field. In this entire, um, what happened in, as you are going to collect, as you collected the data. So you can structure it in terms of the organization, what you know about them and what they do, or the organization, what they do, what you know about them, and then maybe how they do their things. So depending on what you want to study, what is your core thing you want to study? And then what is the background to what is called? So there's a part called the background to the phenomenon and then the, the case phenomenon itself. But even before the background of the phenomenon, others try to separate what we call the firm profile from the background to the phenomenon. 
So let's take an example. Maize is a season, season, seasonal produce that requires a cost savings technique, requires cost saving techniques in trade activities. The old dry maize is preferred to a fresh one. For this reason, planting and harvesting are well planned by farmers. So a very good maize wholesaler should also be able to appreciate what the person has written here. Good, the first part. So now we can say that we have, sorry. Good. We can say that for the first part, we have been able to identify uh, farmers who can be able to, um, farmers and how they relate with the maize, the seasonality of maize. Now, I'm then giving you the background to the phenomenon because I'm not going to tell you what, what occurs. Then I go on to explain that Grace is a wholesaler who has four retailers in Accra. She has primary school level education, has learned the truth from my mother. That one that I've just said, sorry, is more about the firm profile, who Grace is. The background of the phenomenon is about how, to, how they use mobile. So the background to it is what I read earlier. The fiscal one I read, I read nice for context. So you have to be able to understand that when you're collecting your data, you have to know where your, your issues, uh, the data you're collecting, where it is contributing to. Some students spend the time collecting data and all of it is just about the background of the phenomenon, not about the phenomenon itself. So how the phenomenon transfers, how people leave the background to go to a phenomenon is very, very sketchy. They don't do it very well. They just end up spending for a, a 2000 word case study, you see that maybe 1,400 is all about the background to the phenomenon. The real issues that you're supposed to study, it doesn't have enough information on that. So you have got a case contest that tells you about the firm profile, the firm itself, what it does, and then the background to the phenomenon. So how did the firm get into that, whatever you're trying to study? And what is the one that caused it? So in the background to the phenomenon, you may want to look at the precursor to the phenomenon, the first instance of occurrence, initial perspectives. Okay, so it could be like somebody, what the person obtained from a pilot relation um, as explore, as exploration of the issue before the main issue started. Okay. Now, let me just see if I can find a paper that has these things in it so that you can actually appreciate it better because I like using an example. Then you can also then ask questions after I show them. So there is this, um, So this is about, okay, so look at it. E-commerce capabilities of a Ghanaian used car retailer. Okay. So look at the firm profile. So all here is about the firm profile. How the firm began, and then what the firm does. Okay. Then after that, it goes to talk about business startup. How the firm, be, be, sorry, how the firm began this one year. How the firm was formulated and then how they got into this type of business in selling cars. So that one is more of what I was pointing out that. What is the background to the phenomenon? So this one becomes the background to the phenomenon. Of, the phenomenon in this particular paper is about e-commerce. So this is the background to it, how the firm began and started selling cars on the internet. So it will tell you about a fair type of car he sold on the internet and how, he, how much he made and how he continued to sustain it. The end. So you have the first pages and first customer, customer order, all because of the fact that I'm giving you a background to the phenomenon. So the actual issue then starts from here. E-commerce capability development, how was it developed? So by the time you reach here, I've been able to explain to you the organization and then what the organization is about and what they have achieved. 
Then when I get to the e-commerce capabilities, I can now look at the issues I want to study. So in every, in every good, in effect, in every good case study report, the person has a background of the firm, the, the firm's profile, then the background to the phenomenon that you are coming to explore, and then the exploration process itself. Okay, any question? Any question? Okay. So now let me then ask a question. Let's look at my PhD. Those of you have had my PhD and you have looked at it before, you understand it better. Oh, please, Benny's hand is up. Uh, can you coordinate it once I look for the PhD? Benny, please do it. Okay. So, um, Prof, please, I want to find out. Um, does all um, this information come uh, under the analysis? where you are trying to transcribe the data and then um, speak about it, do you need to give a background to the case study and all that um, during the analysis or which part of the study does this one really um, factored in? Okay, so that's why it is good to look at a PAD. I don't know whether I've seen my PAD before. No, please. Oh, but I thought you are giving it to them by now. Yes, Prof. I've shared it with them before. Hey, students, students. <laughs> hey. You students, you are very interested. Last week, somebody came doing it. Somebody came to ask a question that these assignments that Prof. I put there was confused. You, I didn't know the same. I said, hey, these students, we were here last week. We explained this thing. I even asked any question. Oh, sir, we are okay. Any question, we are okay. We are okay. Oh. Anyway, so let's actually look at my table of contents. It will help you understand and appreciate it. So in my table of contents, what you said, you are mixing two things. That's what we call the findings. What I'm trying to do is the findings. I'm trying to present the findings, what I found in the case. Then I'll analyze it and I'll discuss it. But in you see, let me just, I don't want to digress, but in the reality, if you come from the school of thought from, of Mouse and Huberman, or someone like um, a critical realist, or even a reproduction. Why are things that you, oh, why is that thing giving me? Why are things that you realize is that, can, is it better now? Hello? Yes, probably can see. No, it's not my can see. My voice became different. I was hearing some feedback, that's why. Okay, good. So one of the things that you, you, you realize is the fact that every time that you are presenting your, your, your work, you need to be able to appreciate that you are also analyzing because you are making a choice of what I'll put on the paper and what I'll not put on the paper. So analysis has started. So after you start collecting the data, after analysis, when you make a lot of choices. But anyway, what she means by analysis is more about and putting and um, drawing out the themes and then using to do some other form of discussions. Okay, now look at my PAD e-commerce in Ghana. This is where my case study starts from. So each of these case, introduction, language council, firm profile, business response development stage, business startup, finding a car supplier online, finding first speeches and first customer, e-commerce capability development, Informational capability, the timeline. So look at this, I'm using chronological order. International capability, another timeline. Field research and redesign the website, another one. Design of the interactive site. Managing resources to address constraints. Managing payment constraints. Managing, um, addressing, sorry, business competition. Second case, Casa Green, that's Casa Preco, company limited, firm profile, business resource development. Business startup, exploring export, export opportunities, e-commerce capabilities development in Casa Preco, information capability develop, capability development, or international capability. So I give the timelines. Managing resources yeah. to address constraints. So if you look at it, some of the key headings are the same, but the content is dependent on the organization. So this is a multiple case study in which my unit of analysis is each of the cases. So after Casa Preco, I have another one, Desmond Fabrics and Garments, Firm 3, 
then firm profile, business resource development, business data, exporting just one products, e-commerce capability. So all of these things are stories that I've gone to the field and listened to the person and heard the person. So I've combined interviews. I've combined focus group discussions. I've also combined it with um, uh, digital ethnography material, something like even sometimes pictures from the field of, of, of study and then studying the picture Inf information notes that you are made from maybe interactions and discussions in the informal way and put them all of them together to be able to build a good a rich richness of the story okay, okay. now the, you asked a question that does all of these things go into your analysis so in my this is my case presentation then i have a i have a whole chapter which which i use for chapter eight which I use for my discussion and analysis. So I draw out the key issues. But before I go in there, I began the preliminary analysis in 7.5. So in 7.5, you see several tables in which I bring out the themes from the three case study. Okay, so 7.5. Sorry, I'm coming in. So look at it. This is a this is seven point five point two point something. So I want to get to the seven point five itself. But this is it. So summary seven point five. So I'm summarizing from what I've learned from the three cases. We call it cross cross case analysis. So first of all, in terms of the capabilities deployed, developed, so the three cases, I use a timeline approach to tell you the relationship between what was happening in Ghana. We call the internal context and the external context. The internal context is in the, the different companies. The external context is what's happening in the country. I realized that as ICT was improving and becoming cheaper and more relatively accessible, the companies were de developing better capabilities in using information systems. So in the beginning, around the 1999-2001, most of the companies were having informational websites, just a static website that had just some content about them. And as they moved towards the 2007, they all moved towards more of interactional websites. That's what you see here, interactional, interactional. Good. So then I try to explain it. So the diagram comes and I go to the tables where I can then compare different types of capabilities and then look at the different firms where they went through at each timeline. So all these are cross case analysis. So I'm doing summaries. It is these summaries that I finish and I go to chapter eight and I start my discussion. So if you look at my chapter eight, I call it a discussion or, or analysis. In fact, that's, sorry, that's not in my real thesis. Yeah, the one I was compiling it into a book. I put pointers into for let students understand what's happening in the chapter. So here, through analytical comprise of three cases, this chapter will evaluate the research propositions to inform the application of resource-based theory to e-commerce adoption and internalization in DCs. So what we are trying to see here is more of how we can pick the information and relate it to the literature. So I start from this one, and I'll start information and e-commerce capability. I talk about what I found in the three companies, and then I relate to the literature. So I've done, I've started discussion. Discussion when you take the literature, and they related to the findings you have found on the field, or you take the findings you have found on the field, you have found on the field and related to literature. Okay. So this is very these issues that you are asking, they are quite important questions. So don't be don't be shy in asking them. It's a very good question you ask. There's another question in the in the chat. So yes, Richmond is asking, he's asking during data collection, how do you handle language barrier, especially in situations where you are interviewing less educated audience and can't find local meanings to certain words? My experience in Uganda, we're doing a study on HIV is, and apparently they had three different ways for HIV AIDS depending on who you are talking to, whether it's a child, as a female, or it's an elderly person or a, an older person. So it comes, it comes up, even in, in French, 
um, if you are trying to say uh, uh, you have to ask please. If you are talking to an elderly person, how you say please is in French is different than if you are speaking to somebody who is your mate. So see we play like this is for someone who is more of like an elderly and the child is talking to elderly. And then the other one is more about C to play or something like that. Those who are French will, will be able to explain it better. So you are seeing it because that one, the person is much more like your friend or at your level. If you go to uh, Thailand to, depending on the male or female, you sour the cap, sour the crab, um, um, depending on who you are talking to. So in the same way, it's likely that you are going to go to the field and even in language, even in English language, you have to know how you use certain words to be able to explain the point that you are putting across. Now, if you are doing a study that has language barriers, you need to be able to make sure that you have an interpreter or you are recording the thing in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the lingua of the people, how they express the answers. Then you don't have to find somebody from ESA or somebody who is a, lang a, lang a linguist to be able to understand, read it and bring it out the meaning. But one thing the person may not be able to capture is the emotional settings and conditions that you can make out of observation in which when a person who came to, uh, the person who is listening to the interview may not be able to capture that part. So in the interpretation, you may interpret, interpret it without the context. So that makes it difficult. That's why it's good that if you're going to have an interpreter, the interpreter is our, with you whilst you're collecting the, 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 the data so they can appreciate it. Others also do it because of budget, budget issues. What they may do is that they record in verbatim what happened using the, an audio recorder. And then the rest, while the recorder is taking place, any other things they do in case of observation, they write in, in a detailed explanation. Maybe two people will write and after they compare it to say this is a detailed account of what occurred. Okay, so um, I don't know whether it answers this question because whatever it is, you still need an interpreter, whether it's before or after the study or after the data collection. What is my question? Thank you. Now, so you have the case context. Now, um, let me just ask a question. Maybe the guy who just asked the question can answer. When you take any, any institution, any firm, any qualitative research study, why do you think that this your person cannot just write on just the background the phenomenon and the case phenomenon and just forget about the case context? Why would the person, why is the case context necessary? Yes, I'm asking a question. I'm not going to answer for the class. I want to see whether you understand it. Well, please, can you come again? For any case study approach, and you are come to write it out, why is the case context important when you are writing out this case? Yes, those who are holding your hands up. Look at that. Oh, but can you coordinate it? I'm not showing the students, so I can see. Uh, Benis, please go ahead. Okay. So um, I think the case context is important because every mm -hmm. context presents um, different dimensions. Um, for example, um, if you're looking at the firm profile, maybe the time it was started, the history and everything has implication for uh, the particular uh, what you are doing. So if, for example, you are looking at two or, or multiple cases, it is very important to look at the context, which will bring out some um, differences that will help um, tease out um, certain uh, information you need for the work. Yeah, we are right. 
if you look at my PhD, so I have, I have a whole chapter on context of study, which you call, I titled it, is e-commerce and practical reality in Ghana. The objective of this chapter was to try to let you understand how Ghana has progressed in the usage of internet from the time internet came to Ghana and how ICT began. So I even started from brief statistics about Ghana. Give the information about Ghana, what we produce, what we do. Um, hey, there was a time that Ghana's stock exchange was the third best stock exchange in the world. Right now we are the worst currency after Sri, hey, Sri Lanka. <laughs> Ghana has been has been Ghana before. <laughs> anyway, 2004, it was what Chairman Rollins, who was our president? President Kufo. President Kufo. Okay. Uh, you went to two years. Okay. So look at e-commerce assimilation in Ghana, government readiness, technological readiness, market force readiness, cultural readiness. So I studied it. And I explained uh, our move from um, telecom Ghana, Ghana telecom to, you know, first was post and telecommunication, then we went to Ghana telecom, then later to all the other comms that we have created. Then I talk about the policies that we had. And from there, I also went on to discuss the technological readiness and the cultural readiness. I even talked about news portals, doing business in Ghana, why traditional values are important. All of these things was to try to understand how people use, prefer to do things face to face than online. Okay. Now, so when I finished, I was able to do my analysis or in relation to my conceptual framework. And I came up with certain findings before I went to e-commerce in Ghana. So in my discussion chapter, I come, I pulled information from both chapter seven and chapter six. So the context is very, very important to get a holistic view of what is occurring. Okay. So this is why the quest context is important. We have mentioned that. Okay, and then um, what else? The next thing is that what goes into a case context? First of all, who is organization? How do they do their things? What resources do they have? What have they achieved? Or what do they engage in? What's the structure? Any achievements, any financial, any information about financial performance? Now, this is very good to keep a picture of the organization, but it doesn't mean that everything is what you put in every paper you write. Then after that, you have to also select your respondents that you are going to engage with. The respondents, there are different types of them. There are respondents who have direct knowledge of the what you are going to discuss. And there are respondents who have indirect knowledge. Then there are respondents who are external to the organization. And then there are respondents who are in, just internal or they're also cross-boundary. They work for like a consultant who's working for, uh, who sits in between different partners. Now, the first set of respondents, we are looking at it in terms of differentiating, differentiating them in terms of the knowledge they have about the issue, whether it's direct or indirect knowledge. And then their position, where they are, or location, where they are, in external to organization or internal to organization. Okay. Then the second one is about, in terms of time, the activity, or whether the person is a referred person. So you have got A. Some people, some respondents are time related. That means at a particular point in time, they were in the organization or they were engaged with the phenomenon. Others also are more transitional. So for example, 
there are people who are in charge of university graduation. If your case studies about different graduation systems in the different universities, comparing them, we have to know that it's time related in one factor. That means that they would do it at a particular time of the year. So those actors will come together at that time of the year. Number two, it's also an event. So there's a start point and a close time. So, and, it's, and the, the principles about event management may govern it. Number three, there could be certain things that can come out of it that may inform other decisions and lifestyle. That can also make it transitional. And then there's also the snowball respondent. The person who is led by another person, then led by another person, and you can also build the whole picture. So if you don't know the type of respondents you have and the, the different roles they play, you may bring respondents who are just direct to the information, but they may not necessarily be able to give you out of the box solutions. Okay. Or respondents who are indirect. So let me just give an example. If I am talking to like a football team, the respondents who are that knowledge of the organization may be the, the, um, the, the people who work with the football team, like the coaches, the coaches, and then the players, and then the um, anybody that helps them carrying out their um, in carrying out the activities, even the, the trainers, the goalkeeper trainer, and all the other people who help them to build, build themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, even they may have the manager, they may have the doctor, all of them are part of the direct knowledge. There are those who are also about indirect knowledge. It could be a journalist. Hmm. Or a new castada, a news that can push you to say something you don't want to say. Not necessarily that they are bad, but I'm trying to say they are external to the, they have indirect knowledge. So they always their knowledge is mediated by somebody who is internal. And there are those who are also purely external to the organization in the sense that they have never done anything in the organization that we are trying to study. So for example, you have an, 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 an international auditor. You may not have intimate knowledge with the firms here, but you still may have to do something with the firm, firms here. So each respondent that you take for your study, you have to know which of the categories does it belong to. So these are the typical examples. So we, we broke down this one down for a study that was a person who was carrying out in Ghanaian University. So the first one is Pub 1, Public University 1 and Public University 2, and Private University 1 and Private University 2. So for all of them, you talk to the institutional leaders, but it's only the two private universities that allowed you to have access to institutional leaders. I can imagine what he did in the... Uh, um, the public sector is The program coordinator is able to get across content developer, go to the only in the public university, but not in the private systems network administrator throughout uh, three and the four different universities we are compared. Um, Timetable developer, developer, you have got one and then two. Technical support, almost everybody has technical support. And then um, students, undergraduates, that's regular and distance. Okay. And various disciplines. Okay. So, I want multiple sources. There are different types of data you may need to collect to be able to write your case. I think I'll pause here because this is now taking me to a different part where I have to discuss all the different methods. Of data collection. Okay. Now, what we have seen here, okay, let me so go to documentation, archival records, interview, and focus group discussions, audiovisual, participant and non participant observation, and fiscal product and service examination. So, we have got oh, the. Uh, Clements, Clements, and this up. Yeah. Clements, please go on. Yeah, Prof. Uh, the, the the respondents, in case your respondents are external of the selected organization, 
are you going to, uh, when you come to the analysis, are you going to uh, analyze them as part of the organization or you separate them from uh, the, 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 the profile of the organizations? That's a good question. Mm. I should say, extend out to the phenomenon, not to the organization, to the phenomenon you're trying to Yeah, say. yeah. Mm. Now, I would advise that it depends on this on the type of study you are doing. Okay. Some studies you may need to have the, all the third parties who are non core to the issue, different from those who are core. In other studies, there are no, there are no boundaries in it, you can actually just mix them. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Okay. So let me give an example. In the mobile and micro trading prepare work that we had, I focus on some market traders, but we still talk to four telecom, telecom providers, four, four marketing managers. Now, the reason why we talk to four marketing managers is for you to understand. So, do you understand the decisions that they take? And what informs that this one, you know, good. what informs their marketing strategies? Okay, so, so we use that one to help us also collaborate our findings that we gain from the students. So, pick information from external people because good, it's for, especially if you're going to triangulate and then use it to make a point. So this is how you see data displays. So sometimes somebody will use, even though it's quite qualitative in terms of case study, somebody may have um, a case, um, uh, some data be showing like this one, financial profile and cost of the mobile answers. Then a website, how it is labeled, can be captured. Okay, so we can also look at the, the logic flow of how activities take place, and that one can be drawn. After you're collecting the data, you can draw it out there for, to enhance understanding. And sometimes in the real world context, we're going to capture this uh, um, a tomato market in Nigeria, which is part of, I think, closer to one of the markets that we have circled here, either Wuzi or Gaza. Okay. Now, every good case study will always have direct codes to be able to enhance the uh, possibility of the case. So we want to be sure that you are on the field collecting the data. So we want to see some cases from you or some um, write up from the person who is carrying out the study. So some summaries coming out from the people you interviewed. So do you have anything that will show? So sometimes we ask that if you are writing a case study, you should illustrate the voices of the people in the case, because that's what helps. So I have to be able to know that this was actually taking place. Okay. So direct costs may come from so many different people, can come from customers, can come from people who are even previous customers, and you may capture it you to do your work. Okay. Now, what you see here is the two differences that we're talking about. The case study protocol tells you how you're going to collect the data and where it's going to collect the data from and the method is going to use. The case study database will rather capture all that was collected and the case study report itself. And then it will try and organize them appropriately. 
which will increase the reliability of the research that you have. Okay, so now let me show you an example of some of these things in practice. Then we can then come back later to look at it. So this is, uh, no, this is not the right one. I want to show you my PD. Um, Uh -huh, so this is it. So let's look at it. Um, Okay, so in this my PAD, if you go to the end of the PAD, I wanted to make sure that all the pages are there. You see a case study protocol. But for the dominant theories, count across a case study protocol. Okay, so data collection, case profiling. So this is a case report structure. The firm's background, e-commerce evolution, e-commerce development approach, and then future planned, future development. So this is how we're getting the firms to write out their stories. Then I have my structured interviews. Who am I interviewing? Look at my internal and external. Remember I mentioned that internal and external respondents. Who are the internal, who are the external? So these are the people who are coming outside the organization. And then I have the interview objectives. Why am I interviewing them? So these are the questions that, these are the objectives that are guiding me in the interview process. Then artifact examination, which is also a qualitative approach. We can, um, we can look at look at the functionality of the artifacts and then their usage. Functionality website, the interface, all the different types of things we see, the information, information and content, the firm profile, and all those kind of um, transactional abilities that you have on the page. So that is all will help them. Then after that, how do you measure usage? Website traffic details, external information provided online. So then, then email to the usage, websites, email, and then okay. So you have got the different capabilities that can be offered on the website, all put there. Together. Then the documents, what kind of documentary analysis and internal reports and then trade reports or industry reports. And why are you using those ones, documentary analysis? So when I finish and I put out my case study, my case, uh, my case study protocol, I put it together and I develop my case study um, report outline which will help me capture the content. I also went on to do the rest of the things that to do with my, my case study database, all that is needed is captured there. So here I have 
all that I collected the data from, main keys firms, and list of other firms that I also consulted to be able to build and um, build a whole uh, kind of a matrix of which, which organization, what type of, what they do and what and why I'm interviewing them. So that's all I see here. Okay. So this is important. This one, by the time you finish your study, you will be able to develop this. But the rest of the things will guide you. Everybody, everybody you're going to interview, there has to be a reason why you're interviewing them. So that can guide you to develop your personnel appropriately. Any more questions? No, but I said, do you necessarily need to include all respondents external to the phenomenon when you can get all the required info for internal? It may not be necessary. May not be necessary. Okay, so, so at one point, sorry, sorry, bro. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I was, I'll just ask, at what point would you want to ha add um, some information from your, uh, from, uh, from, from people, from uh, responders who are external to the organization? Now, it depends on what your story you are telling. So if you're writing a case study, you're writing the report out, you have to find a way of putting it into, either give a, a different perspective on an issue you're trying to present or an argument. So I don't, I can't say there's a particular point, but I think that as you're writing your case, you realize that you may have multiple, you need multiple voices in the case so that it doesn't become biased. And then you may end up trying to do that. But it also depends on the relevance of the person's contribution. I don't know, I don't know whether I understand me. Yes, I do. I do. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any hand here again. Robert, do you have any question or any other hand? No problem. Okay, class. Since as uh, Clement has raised their hand. Yeah, Prof. Yes, please, Clement, um, please buy. Supposing I'm I'm uh, I'm conducting a research which have uh, different uh, the, the the organizations. Um maybe I'm going to conduct research on the the importance or the role of brand elements on the um brand acceptance and pat patronage and i'm using organizations that have tangible product and organizations that have that are into service products so i'm using a uh, organization with fiscal product and organizations that are offering services am i going to use a uh, multiple case study or single case study well, when it comes to the data collection yeah, it's, it's two different organizations, so they are all multiple. Multiple. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thank you, Prof. Yes, please. Hello, Prof. Yes, please. Uh, will it be the same if it's the same organization but has a product that are both tangible and then intangible? Like, let's say Twitter, they, 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 they service and sell. So, when the first be, they'll be different or the same? Okay. Is there any question anymore? <clears throat> Uh, my 
Qatar question. Is that the question? Okay, there's no question. So, In the past, I made students do this assignment, but I'll hold on for you guys. But maybe we can we can look at it the next time we'll discuss it together. So this is what I will, I will say. Can all the students, all of us do, look at number G, one G. One G, okay. And number two, I will also get the university's ethical guidelines open oh, remind me so that I can take them through the ethical guidelines approach. Okay, Paul. So look at one G, all the students look at one G. And see what I can get, um, what I've told you to do within one G. Okay, so look at the ethical guidelines and then and then apply for ethics, ethical reports in the UG. And then the, I would advise that everybody look at this and get it ready. When you come, we'll discuss it together. Thank you. Oh, but have you captured it? As have student captured it? G. No problem. Is, I yes, say, have you captured it? G. Yes, prof. Okay, class. Thank you very much. Time I took my time to explain, so I hope people will understand me better. Because case study is very confusing. Until you start writing one, you don't know you, whether you know how to do it. What about my line? <laughs> uh, yes, Paul. <laughs>